Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for joining me. We are here live in the Doolittle Studios getting set up. We are going to talk about the Chinese balloon that is floating somewhere over, I think, Virginia or South Carolina right now. And then we're going to talk about ChatGPT. Is it going to destroy education? Will it destroy democracy? Will it destroy everything else? Are we headed for a Terminator future? Well, the news is really concerned, so we're going to ask if you should be concerned. So uh, we've got our panel of nerds here that know technology, and they're going to uh, give you an answer. So with that, stay tuned. We will be right back after this break. Welcome back to We Are Libertarians here on The Chris Spangle Show. Thank you so much for joining me. We are so glad that you are back here with us today. And uh, we are in the Doolittle Studios, and we've got uh, all, a, a cast of characters joining us. Uh, first and foremost is Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good, going good. Um, little had a little running late start today. Uh, that was my fault. That's just who I am as a person. I apologize. Please take this as a blanket apology. Even though I, I, I'm going to be 15 minutes early. I said I'd be here 15 minutes early. I was still 15 minutes late. So I got two phones. Did anyone else get a text that he was going to be late? Group chat. Mm -hmm. I sent it to the group chat. Oh, okay. uh, I was oh, always supposed to be here at, on, at 55. It was on Messenger, so right. Of course he didn't, <laughs> he didn't it notice it. It wasn't the oh, Slack okay, or okay. Team Mastodon oh, right. sub channel or that voice or anything. Semaphore. The 8,700 different ways that I have to text with Harry because he won't use Facebook Messenger. Does anybody else have a friend like that? Well, uh, uh, email me on Proton. I had a uh, somebody emailed me and said, I want to use you to edit video and produce podcasts for me. Or uh, it was actually the lady's son, and he does a Bitcoin podcast. It looked really good, really well done. She said, oh, he doesn't use email. You're going to have to DM him on Signal. And uh, I just didn't do it because I just can tell it's just not it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. I'm not going to do it. If you can't email me, it's, sorry. It's just how it is. You emails. nerds take it too far. That's what I'm saying, Harry. Email is fine. Email is the backbone of the internet. It's a nice, nice, amazing protocol. The I don't know why this person doesn't use email. Um, that seems weird. I would rather use email than Signal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a you know proven, proven encryption, proven. You know, well, they're not you know, emails are sent open, non-encrypted, unencrypted, open wire. You can use Wireshark and just read emails unless you encrypt them. So an open relay, you can pretend to be whoever you want to be. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then also here, that's the voice you hear is Reinhold. Say hello, Reinhold. Hello, good morning, and uh, glad everybody could be here when we're actually really live. Yes, it's so good to be live on YouTube and Facebook and return on Saturday mornings. And Twitch. And Twitch, uh, <laughs> the thing that I've only, I've opened for the first time in six months to watch AI Seinfeld, which we'll talk about. Uh, also, here's Vincent from Loki Wall. Vincent, how are you today? Doing pretty good. I'm I was invited because uh, I'm really interested in the AI stuff because that's just kind of who I am. So you'll see when I'm actually invested in a conversation, how much more I talk about. It. Well, we'll see if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And then also here is James Neese. Uh, for those of you maybe seeing James mm -hmm. on the camera for the first time, don't be scared. Mm -hmm. uh, he does not smell as bad as he looks. Uh, yes, I do, because I didn't shower because you told me to get here early. So, <laughs> so all right, some of us was here before Harry got here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. 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 some yes. people showed up on time. I'm not. La I, the last time I was here, I was told I was late in holding everything up, so I showed up extra early. You yeah. were 45 minutes yeah, late. Almost an hour late. I was on I time. Was time. I was just, I was 15 minutes late to the early time that I set, so therefore I was actually on time. He changes times. I don't know. Apparently. Randomly. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. You know, um, the, uh, that's why I don't like the, I prefer when show prep was paper. It was easier because you couldn't you could just change it live like you can with, you know, when it's a digital copy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, Reinhold, you have a bit of a nose. Uh, I can hear your nose. So just, you know, lean back or if that's the kind you can turn off, we'll see. But. I've got the, uh, we've got one processor that works. I don't know what happened sitting in my basement for a year and a half, but we've got five processors, two work. I, of course, get one. And then we've got one on uh, uh, Vincent over there, uh, and it makes him sound very good. Harry doesn't need one. When I put it on Harry, it made him sound worse. You're the first person I've ever met where a processor made you sound bad. I don't know. It, well, 
I, I assume it's just my voice. It's so nice, even though I'm not on camera right now. Uh, but my voice sounds amazing. All right. So I just give it up to that. Amazing. He only does analog. Like, you know, it's <laughs> like everything needs like tape recorded, like old timey radio with like the, the reverb going. That's all I need. I probably will sound amazing oh, yeah. on an AM signal. You know? mm. mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, uh, Reinhold, before the show, you pretended not to know what this Chinese spy balloon was. Do you really not know what, what's going on? I've been heads down at work the last two days, so I haven't paid attention to the uh, crazy news cycle that whatever stupid thing comes up, it doesn't last for more than a day or two. But it sounds to me like somebody saw something in the sky and everybody's freaking out about it. So basically the... Uh, why did I just get really loud? Um, sorry. So basically, there is a Chinese spy balloon that is hovering over. It was started in Montana, and I think it's somewhere south, more, more towards North Carolina at this point. So my question is, as somebody who doesn't know anything about this, how do we know it's a Chinese spy balloon and not just a regular old weather balloon? Okay. So here's the timeline of the balloon, because my question was, how did it get here? Did it float over? The Pacific to get here, or did some Chinese spy release it in Montana? And the uh, Biden administration said last night, late on a Friday night in their news dump, that they knew about this spy balloon floating towards America. They let it come into America and float over the country. And they weren't going to announce that this was happening because this apparently happens all the time. And there's been like half a dozen under the Trump administration, for instance, that that took place. And these spy balloons are very common across the world from different governments. And uh, we don't we send our spy balloons and they don't mess with theirs. And so part of the thinking as to why they don't shoot it down, which is a, a whole thing we'll get into. But um, they because uh, it's apparently a lot harder than just like popping a balloon because people think of this as a balloon. Like you pop it like a helium balloon, but this thing is the size of like three school buses. It's got the volume of 190 Goodyear blimps, mm -hmm. and it's very big. Yes. And so if you shoot it with a missile, it's the same principle as walking out and firing your gun in the air, Harry. Should you on New Year's Eve fire your gun into the air? No, simple pictures to tell us. I, I think the best opinion that we need about this balloon yeah, comes from Vincent. Vincent. Uh, my opinion on the balloon is uh, who cares because because Tencent owns more things connected to people's computers right now, which is connected to the Chinese government, than that balloon could get information. All right, for. we'll we'll get there. Hold on, everybody. <laughs> yeah, slow you down. have the if you've got the Epic launcher on your computer right now, it's taking everything from it. If you've got TikTok installed onto your phone, this program is copying everything from your phone and sending the Chinese government, including your clipboard. So if you think you're slick and copy pasting your passwords out of your password manager, guess what? Tencent has that information because it copies your clipboard, what? even on iOS. All right, hold on. Well. Everybody slow down, okay? <laughs> We're not done explaining what's going on with this balloon situation <laughs> before we start ranting about it. We need everybody to understand what's going what's going on, okay? So uh, I don't know why the sound is terrible. I hope it sounds better on your end. I'm so sorry. We're still working everything out if it sounds a little bit odd. Um, but so the uh, it apparently floated over the Pacific, and we didn't shoot it down then. And now once it gets over the United States, even in Montana, where there's nothing in Montana and Kansas, they didn't want to shoot it down because if you shoot a gun into the air, the bullet goes somewhere. If you shoot a missile into this thing, it it doesn't necessarily pop it. So um, this is a Forbes article. Uh, actually, let me start with the New York, the Washington Post article. Well, just so, before, and some history. Before that, I did see that a sheriff's department put out a notice saying, please don't go out with your guns and try yeah. to shoot at this. Evansville thing. said that too. So um, it, is, it is apparently a long standing tradition for aerial surveillance to be allowed amongst different countries. Dwight D. Eisenhower first proposed an open skies agreement in Geneva in 1955. Um, and you know, people tend to allow other nations to surveil what's going on over there. Now we have satellites. And so I've read reports that this thing doesn't necessarily pick up anything. 
think it's if you could move yours away. I think there, there we go. Perfect. And then just moved over and you're ready. Um, this thing apparently doesn't pick up anything more than what you get from. Uh, I think it may be you. So you move your mic a little bit. Just, there's just a nose whistle from somebody going on here that's driving me crazy. I don't breathe, sir. <laughs> I know. Uh, so you can you you can get a satellite to pick up all this information. Um, the United States and Russia have pulled out of the Open Skies Treaty, uh, so we don't. And and China never signed on to it. Um, but apparently there was a balloon. I'm trying to find the history here. Uh, duh, 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 duh where it floated into so let me just read you a little bit from this forbes article busting that chinese spy balloon is harder than you think um the problem of getting so let's in fact bringing down this type of balloon may be difficult it is highly resistant to available weapons it may look fragile but the sheer size and construction of the stratospheric balloon makes it all but invulnerable there's also a problem of getting to it. It it rides in the stratosphere, far above airliners. Mm -hmm. They do this to advantage uh, to take advantage of the change in wind direction with altitude to steer themselves to where they need to go, like ships. Uh, we have our own balloon program designed to lurk undetected in enemy airspace. Such balloons typically fly at eighty thousand feet or more. NASA's version versions cruise at one hundred and twenty thousand feet. An F-15 and an F-22, the Eagle and the Raptor, respectively, um, operate around 65,000 feet. So this thing operates about 15,000 feet more than a typical balloon. And while that might be able to get close enough to fire a missile, the balloon may be too high for them to actually shoot. So you're not going to hit it with your AR-15. So please don't get a murder charge because you accidentally uh, killed someone with by discharging your weapon. Um, so we tend to think of like the Hindenburg disaster, but this isn't like that. Uh, these are colossal balloons. NASA's standard balloons are 40 million cubic feet, the equivalent of more than 195 Goodyear blimps. And you could fit an entire football stadium inside of one of these. The balloon envelope is made of plastic material no thicker than a sandwich wrap, and the pressure difference between inside and outside is small. Attempting to let the air out by punching a few holes with a bullet or a missile is like trying to ventilate an entire warehouse with fresh air by opening one small window. Uh, in 1998, a rogue Canadian weather balloon drifted towards Russian airspace. So Canada, Norway, and Sweden attempted to bring it down without success. Two Canadian F CF-18s hit the balloon with more than a 1,000 rounds of 20-millimeter cannon fire off the coast of Newfoundland, riddling it with holes. That was not enough to let significant amount of gas out, and the balloon continued to drift. A uh, volley of 2.78 inch rockets, uh, 2.75 inch rockets, were equally ineffective as the high explosive rocket simply flew through the balloon without detonating because it's too thin to actually trigger it. Maybe the uh, real, any missile fired may be a greater hazard to civilians when it lands than the balloon itself because, after all, the Chinese can get this with satellite information. Now, why are they actually launching this? So there was in the last couple of days. Um, now, China has taken credit for it. They said this was just a weather balloon gone rogue. Uh, so it is just it's out there. Um, uh, and they have taken credit for it. The military says basically it's just too disruptive. We can't take it down. Um, and there's nothing we can do. So you just got to let it float. These things are usually hidden from the public view because they don't want everybody to get alarmed and they don't want to shoot it down because they don't want our shot down when we're flying over Russia and usually they're undetected. But this got detected in Montana and a picture was posted by a, a Billings newspaper and uh, that is how it got discovered. And uh, so here's my theory on why we are hearing about this as opposed to other people, you know, other balloons. Uh, President Biden and uh, has announced basically the U.S. military is expanding its presence in the Philippines, which leaves little doubt that we are positioning ourselves in America to constrain China's armed forces and defend against Taiwan. This was three days ago. So, Harry, what better way to make the American military and Joe Biden look like a bunch of feckless, ineffective boobs 
than to float a balloon where it, you know it can be seen, knowing they're not going to do anything, float a second balloon up through Latin America. There's one off Costa Rica right now. And uh, knowing that they're not going to do anything and then pump the internet with network propaganda from Chinese algorithms, especially targeting the right in the country, which already has a lot of network uh, networked capabilities and is already anti-China, anti-Biden. So you make sure that everybody knows it as a way to demoralize the American people and think that their American military can't protect them when you're planning to invade other countries. Does that sound like a good theory? That's my theory. It could be something like well, you could say, like it's a little soft, uh, China projecting soft power doing something like that. Um, but right now, the but China does these things all the time where they just put their fingers very ever so closely to war. They're basically is that little your little brother or sister that you know I'm not touching you. I'm going to get up to the point of combat that right. you think you might have to do something, and then then just back away because you can't do anything about that. Um, and yes, they have tons of different bots and bot storms to come after people to try to you know get a uh, fervor of it. Then also the Biden administration probably wants to lean into that because everything else that's going on for the Democrats inside of Congress or the other crap storm with. Um, you know, classified documents that, you know, I already had our lawyers sweep the studio. We don't have any classified documents here. We're good. Um, because uh, everyone keeps finding them in their garages. It's a, Reinhold just remembers it. He doesn't write anything down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, wait, that's why we don't let Reinhold keep anything here. <laughs> yeah. Can I leave this old box of paperwork here? No, no, you cannot, Reinhold. But no, I just want to store it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it would... This balloon, I honestly, I really do believe this is not the first, nor it will be the last time that the Chinese government um, have lost control of something in the stratosphere or out, out of something in the stratosphere. They have lost control of satellites before. Then getting losing control of this weather balloon is possibly possible. Weather patterns did change. You know, this could just be an a, an, a legitimate accident from the Ch Chinese government. You have no control over weather balloons. They That's put right. them in the air and they just float. You just kind of plan them. And the thing is, is that. This thing doesn't, this takes more than a day or two mm -hmm. to prepare, get up and running and get in the air and get all the way over here. It right. takes, it's this very slow moving mm -hmm. and these things are huge to fill it mm -hmm. up and get it in the air and ready to go. They've yeah. had to have it going for two weeks. Yeah. 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 So I, find it, I find it amazing that. that, I mean, they must have known about it, right? NORAD can track Santa. Why well, can't they track uh, weather balloons? We, we know that there's balloons. There, there's weather balloons, there's spy balloons, there's spy planes, there's all kinds of stuff going on over the top of of all these countries and has been for 70 years at least. Yeah. I mean, that's really the the reason why we had, um, uh, what was the name of the, where the, the UFO landed supposedly? Oh, Roswell? Roswell. Roswell, yeah. Roswell was, an, was one of those types of high that's What Area 54 balloons. was, it was basically where they did... Yeah, I mean, Balloons, this, this yeah. has been going. We've had with, with Cold War in Russia, there has been constant Air, Air 51. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking of Cl <laughs> Club 54. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say and, 51. And, I thought 54, like, 54, 54 well, okay. is the New York Dance Club in the 70s. Sorry, but the um, but this stuff's been going on. Like I said, the Cold War, we had spy planes going over on top of each other. We all mm -hmm. knew it was happening, the, and the governments knew it was happening, but it's like they can't call mm -hmm. it out because if they call out. It, it's kind of like when we found out that um, Russia had hacked the DNC. Yeah. We couldn't l say really how we knew. How we knew was because we had already hacked them. Right. And we were watching them do it. So that was, it was hard to say that, but they had to kind of weasel their way around to saying it that way. It, it kind of dovetails into a little bit of the Biden document story and the Trump document story. Like, Pence took documents. You know, Dick Cheney has more documents than Donald Trump. But well, the thing is, part of the it, the whole thing with the documents is that it, I don't know how much you want to get into that, but it, it's it's irritating because I mean, technically, I've mishandled classified documents. Mm -hmm. I got in trouble for it. I had to pay my penalty. Oh yeah, because you were in the naval. I was the navy. In... I was the navy nuclear power program. Right. We had top secret clearance. Blah, blah. So we and we had to mark all our pages top secret on all our notes. I had forgot to mark a couple. They got found in my note in my locker. Blah blah blah. So, it, handling documents is hard, especially with the number, sheer number of documents that are. So, the, and the fact that 
the prisons aren't boxing up these documents. There, there's people coming in doing it. They, mm -hmm. Some people don't catch it, and it gets stuck in somewhere with it. And that is understandable. And there's a lot and that's not, classified. And there, yeah, and, yeah, and there's not going to be any uh, indictments over that kind of stuff because if you find them and you go, oh, I found them, I better let somebody know and get them back where they're supposed to be. That's what they want you to do. So they're going. Right. You're cooperating. The, the Biden's lawyers, when they found him, could have just said, "Get to shredder, let's <laughs> right. burn this." Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. But they didn't. They well, the difference. The difference between the two stories is so. If you're not familiar with what happened, Joe Biden's lawyers were packing up his office in his Ivy League think tank, which who knew he had a think tank? But they all, you know, if you remember the Clinton Foundation story, they start a foundation. It pays. You know, they get paid to do a lot of speeches. They get paid to do think tank stuff. And so the University of Pennsylvania, I believe it was, had the Biden think tank. And the, he had taken a lot of documents as vice president. Somebody packed them up. Nobody seems to know who. And they stored them in this uh, particular place. And as they were packing up to leave the offices because they were moving, they found, uh, I believe it was like 10 See, classified documents. I don't know that any of them are classified top secret. Now, Mike Pence has found a couple of classified documents in his house in Columbus, Indiana. Uh, now, they've asked all vice presidents and presidents to look for classified documents. As I understand it, it is fairly common for this kind of stuff to happen. And one of the good things about the Trump administration was that Trump did what a lot of other people do or had happened to him, what happens to a lot of other politicians, but he did it to such an egregious level that it becomes a topic of conversation and everybody can see how their government operates in the clear and open. Donald Trump didn't just pack up some stuff. Uh, now, if you're listening to the Daily Wire, he did, but uh, he basically had 54 boxes and it was like 10,000 documents that so he did were, not return to the archives, and there were two separate rounds, yeah. and he had 300 classified documents, and many of those, I think it was like, well, he went beyond. He went beyond ten the top typical, secret or something. Yeah, the typical procedure to have somebody come in and, and go through things as right. packing up. He went through a different process because he's Trump and does things differently. He took but, stuff like Roger Stone's yeah. pardon. Yeah, yeah. He, he took, took it. He took it for. He targeted some stuff too. He yeah. took stuff that. Well, they're never going to let me tell my own story. I need to keep this stuff. Or I can sell Roger Stone's pardon for a profit, or you know. So he I have I have information on somebody I can use for leverage. Exactly. So he took stuff that he knew he could use in some form or fashion later. Didn't return these tens of thousands of documents to the National Archives. They asked for them back, knowing what was missing. He said no. They got into a legal fight, and that's what triggered the FBI coming in. It was not a raid. He called it a raid. Everybody else calls it a raid. And that was sort of Trumpian propaganda that we all bought into initially. Um, they were executing a warrant for something because this man took documents that belong to uh, the United States government. And a perfect example is that once they found all this stuff, they had lawyers going into other storage areas. Yeah. And they found a couple of documents in a storage locker that Trump had. And the the Department of Justice is like, okay, that is understandable that there's no there's no um, intent at that point. So that's the thing about <laughs> Harry's telling us to reel it in. I'll say, I'm just going to say it, but that's that's really the point there is that there's mens rea, there is intent. The intent was not for for Pence or for Biden or any of these people. Uh, there's a story about a little girl. Allegedly, I, as far as right. we can tell. But we have good provable intent on Trump's side that he meant to take those. Including him saying it at a rally. Yeah. He's, He's admitted to everything. He and said it at a rally part. to try and shift the news cycle away from uh, the Nick Fuentes stuff, and it didn't work. Uh, he just admitted to the to the Stormy Daniels stuff on Truth Social, the thing he is being investigated for, he admitted to. I, I don't know. But anyways, all right, enough about that. I don't know. Do you guys have – what do you want to say about the spy balloon – um, go ahead, James. I don't know. I, I just heard when, when Ryan Hill was talking about like storing top secret nuclear documents in his locker. I was just expecting the flashbang to come through the window, bro. It's like, <laughs> let's go, let's boog it. Vincent, the the whole spy balloon is it's ridiculous to me. It's like, what are they going to? What information are they going to get that that isn't going to be given 
voluntarily by people who are already giving that information. Yeah. Tencent, which is a gaming company, owns League of Legends and most of Epic Games. So anybody who plays Fortnite or League of Legends, they have they're already giving their information. Is it a Chinese willingly. a Chinese company? Tencent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not only a Chinese yes. company, they they're giving thirty percent of their profits to the CCP. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, to, and to be a large company, <laughs> you have to have someone a member of the party right in in your company. You have right. to have it, you know. You have to have a person in the party in your company. Right. So anybody who plays any of the kids who any parents who are like, "Here son, you can play Fortnite and put Fortnite on their thing." They're already giving they're willingly giving their information to the CCP anyway. I, I yeah, and TikTok, obviously yeah. there's the, yeah. the debate yeah. about TikTok. So TikTok is so you put it on your phone, so it's getting your GPS information, it's already picking up radio signals. So I don't know what you think this blue is getting that your phone you're not also giving with your with your phone. So t- talk a little bit about TikTok and and the why they want to ban it and what's the problem with it. TikTok sh- um, they want to ban TikTok because I'm it, guessing it, you don't have it on your phone. No, I do not. I no, have to for work, but you do. So what? Why don't you put it on your phone? What's the problem with it? Uh, TikTok, because when someone reversed engineer TikTok, they found out that one TikTok is. I don't want to get into this too much, but TikTok's app is doing just what most social media companies are doing. They're pulling in all all this information, but with the a lot of American companies are using for ad revenue and selling ads to you. The it's more of the unknown of what the CCP is using this information for and gathering. We all do know that, um, which we found out from Ukraine, is that a lot of the state agencies are using this information that they're stealing from people's phone from social media sites and using it to target things. This is the main reason when stupid people went over to Ukraine, a lot of things got bombed early on because they were just used like, oh, you post this on Instagram? Thanks for late leaking our metadata. Right. You know, we know exactly where the heck you are. Um, you know, it's the same thing, it, same way with the Ukrainians going after the Russians because Russians had TikTok and, you know, doing stupid stuff on their phones. But so you're and like I said, with the clipboard thing. So when someone reverse engineered TikTok, they also found out that it was copying your clipboard, which a lot of people use for they type in passwords or mm. copy and paste passwords because they've got it saved somewhere. Or like, let's say like uh, I texted you the password to the bank and then you. You know, you put it in your clipboard, a copy right. of the text message, and you post it there. Cool. The TikTok, the TikTok app scans your entire clipboard every freaking time. Right. So, you know, it's it's like the American, it's like NASA gathering all of our metadata for our emails and phone calls and text messages. And they have access to it all, but they say they just look at the metadata. Um, metadata and, is huge. And, and, NSA, and, not NASA. And everybody, yeah, not NASA, the NSA. Um, and everybody, every government on earth, well, most governments, most major governments probably do all this stuff too and collect all this information. Um, and they say, well, it's just metadata, Harry. Uh, the Chinese government, the American government are just taking the metadata of your email. What is it? What is that? United States government, what does that mean? The United States government claims metadata. The Chinese government takes everything, they don't care. You don't have no civil. The Chinese government doesn't care. They they will take your information. They will take that. Just like all right. So everyone's seen those a lot of these protests that happened in China, these in Hong Kong and all these all these protests over like the uh, over the COVID protesting, right? And China, the Chinese government supposedly like relaxed a lot of that and like oh we've gotten rid of zero COVID stuff like that, which they kind of did. They kind of did relax it, but they did not take that lying down. A lot of those people that did all that are they're gone. They're gone. They've been picked up. Yeah. A lot of people who were they just close to that because the of their metadata, they, searched they know the meta- yeah, metadata they, location. They found the phone and they picked them up and took them. They are gone. They are missing. All those brave men and women in China that stood up to the CCP, they'll probably never be seen again. They're right. gone. Yeah. You, know, you watch those protests. Every those people holding up the A4 protests, holding up the blank A4 sheets of paper, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah. Uh, and, and then they, they go through their fear. they go through their phones and they find some reason to put them in a in a prison camp. Um, Not even they can just go. Oh, this is where you are. Well, you protested, and then they don't really have to give a reason because there's nobody that holds them accountable. Right. right. They hold themselves accountable. Yeah. So like you guys are against us, we're just going to take you away and yeah. put you in these camps into these Uyghurs that we've been still having camps that nobody wants to talk about anymore. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah Uyghur, the Falun Gong. Um, no, uh, the Chinese government. <laughs> China is as whole. Okay. <laughs> China is asshole. Yes, CCP is It asshole, is a yes. terrible, terrible organization. The Chinese people are amazing, but the CCP, they're the a-holes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's a movie I just watched called The Laundromat on Netflix that 
is basically a movie version of the Panama Papers, and they talk about China and the Falun Gong and how they just basically you're pro you're just part of this cult, and then they come in and they harvest your organs. Yep. Um, yep. So which check we, that out. Yeah, which, which is where the epoch comes in. Yeah, the, the Epic Times is run by the Falun Gong, mm -hmm. which they came to New York to start an anti Chinese paper, mm -hmm. an anti CCP paper which was the Epic Times, which then got funded by the Mercers, I believe, or some. No, I think it was just they, they became sort of like right wing yeah. as a as an organization. So well, they linked because people were the because they realized who was buying their paper. Right. You know, yeah. like a lot of people on the right wing was actually buying into it and liking something because they did try to get some of the. Well, the right's going to be more anti CCP. Right? Yeah. Yes. So that makes sense. All right, so let's uh, end there on that discussion. We'll flesh more of this stuff out in the future. We'll talk TikTok more. Harry, anytime you can rant about China, you're happy. Yeah, pretty much. So the let's, only thing that makes him happier is Elon Musk. Yeah. Let's take a quick break, and then when we return, we will start talking about AI and chat GPT. It seems to be more present in our lives. And, uh, you know, should you be scared to death? Is the Terminator coming for you? So stay tuned. We'll talk about it right after this. Anybody need to pee? I mean, I just pee in the jug, bro. I can, <laughs> this, I, this jug's down right. here. <clears throat> All right. Welcome it's back. This is chat box. Welcome back to the Chris Spangle Show, and we are Libertarians uh, here on the We Are Libertarians <laughs> Podcast Network. Want to say thank you to all of our patrons who support us. We really do appreciate it, especially our one hundred dollar a month. Uh, subscribers, starting with Jason Doolittle, who this studio is named after Jason Doolittle because he helped us get it all set up. Christy Avery, Reinhold, uh, Vincent Peichel, Matthew Durbin, Lars Nordskog, and Jake Edel. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. Now, I wake up every day, and uh, as I'm kind of waking up and uh, watching the Bob and Tom show, whom I work for on YouTube, I'm um, just sort of scanning news articles on memorandum. Uh, the Drudge Report, Real Clear Politics, uh, what's the alter alternate or whatever? I forget. Uh, but, you know, generally I like to go to like aggregators just to scan the headlines and see what everybody's talking about. And I first heard of Jet Chat GPT about two months ago at an industry event amongst kind of local, the local tech crowd. And they said Chat GPT would be disruptive. Then about a month after that, I saw that Google has put out a red alert about this new thing called ChatGPT, that it's basically going to destroy their business. And so some new product is disrupting them right at the time they're being sued for antitrust because no one could ever bring down Google except for the uh, federal government. And then now over the last like two weeks, I've seen stories like literally one of the headlines was, will ChatGPT destroy democracy? Uh Every college exam, I'm going to read you actually something that a college professor sent me, um, and I'll be a little vague so they don't get in trouble, but uh, ChatGPT has the, uh, the education industry completely panicked, that it's going to destroy the college essay. 90% um, of content will be written by AI. Uh, I saw a pastor named Mark Driscoll yesterday say, what happens when 90% of the content written on the internet is done by chat GPT and it's controlled by demons? So now we've added the spiritual realm to it. Uh, BuzzFeed that just laid off a bunch of employees and they said that they're going to start using chat GPT to write a bunch of their quizzes. Um, I, I have seen nothing but doom and gloom around chat GPT and artificial intelligence and how it's going to steal everyone's job coming up. Now, just to kind of further set the paranoia here that you're experiencing if you're reading the news about this thing, and then we'll explain a little bit about what it is and what it does. So this college professor wrote to me, I've already seated the ground on homework in my classes. Students are already using it in our programming courses. Idiots who got 30% are retaking the class all of a sudden have a perfect A-plus code with comments so far this semester. It's going to nullify a huge sector of college and universities. So we started putting instructions into chat GPT to see how smart it actually is if we give it limited information, i.e. what a student would copy and paste from the question. 
So we'd say write code for this basic programming thing that you'd learn at college. And in minutes, it wrote the entire thing with good variable names, properly commented code. It was flawless. And if a student turned that in, I would never grade anything they turned in again because I would just give them an A for the course because they clearly already mastered the subject. So if we give them, ask them to code three programs like we do on exams, a three, four hour exam will now take 10 minutes. It's that good at understanding what I teach. So we don't really have a good answer for it except to maybe not do homework or let them cheat and do homework um, and then use other tools during the exam to proctor everybody. Or some in the uh, university are saying that we now have to have blue books. So you'll be writing out your code like Elon Musk, printing out your code. You'll be sitting down and writing your code into blue books as opposed to doing quizzes the way that you did it. Um, so, uh, I have used chat GPT, so let me pull it up so you can kind of see what this does. Um, I have very limited, I don't know if you guys are, any of you guys using it for anything? I, I want to just make a comment on, on, on that professor. Okay, one. go ahead. There's already a program that exists that, that goes through chat GPT mm -hmm. and sees what the possible variables that it can give, because it only gives so many answers right and then we'll go through of the tests of people using it and go up oh, this is chat gpt and then fail them right so that already exists they already found a way to fix that being an issue yeah. like that and anybody thinking they can't just go on google and find that same code exactly. already posted somewhere which they've been doing for that decade uh, uh, okay yeah. perfectly honest it is teaching them how to get a programming job you know you're going to stay on stack overflow all day and google tab open your, right. your, your director is going to tell yeah. you, like, hey, I'm not saying that's not how I did it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so, terrific honest, honestly, homework with Chat GPT is teaching you, getting you ready for the real world. Right. And, and not only that, finding like, not efficiencies. Even, yeah. yeah. Not even to do your the job programming quicker. part, like the, the essays part. There, there's Chat GPT has only has so many ways of wording things. Mm -hmm. So the way it's worded sounds very unnatural mm -hmm. and it comes off as. Uh, be it being an AI, because it yeah. only has so much vocabulary and so right. much understanding it's going to that's improve. easy to I find mean, out what it is. That's yeah. the As of issue. right now, this is what so, it is. Hold on. So who created ChatGPT? Do you guys know the history of it? Um, what is it called? The... Uh... What was the company it open called? AI? Yeah, yeah, Open AI. Yeah, they created that also with uh, Mid Journey too, right? Yeah, yeah. So and digital Microsoft is looking at buying it for yeah. a large amount of money. It's mm -hmm. usually overburdened, and because so many people are using it, so they're introducing a paid tier to right. get around the fail whale. And basically the, there's like these big crawls on the internet. And so two years ago, it did this crawl of 60% of the mm -hmm. internet. And that's apparently how it ingested its information and created its knowledge bank. So I don't, it, it has a knowledge of me. So if you ask it, who is Chris Spangle? Like I'll show you here. But that's how Google got yeah. its information or any search engine. Right. It just crawls through anything anyway. You can block those few yeah. bots if you want mm -hmm. to. So. Yeah. The other one is that I have been using ChatGPT for code review. Mm -hmm. I actually was like number one code reviewer for like a week for using ChatGPT. <laughs> you just throw it in there because it, it has a, a basic understanding of it because code yeah. is is very, this is how it's done. Mm -hmm. It's not as opinion-based yeah, or open-based. I mean, at some point, I want to have a conversation. We'll do this later. But my concern, my, my question is, is why is this because people consider this a bad thing? I mean, it's just like when we got the telephone or we got electricity. Yeah, so we'll talk about that point yeah, in just okay. a second. So, so it does. It just asked it, who am I, and it didn't have it. But when I previously asked it, who is Chris Spangle, it said he's an American libertarian podcaster, writer, and speaker. He's the founder and director of the We Are Libertarians podcast network and former host of the We Are Libertarians podcast. Spangle is also the publisher of the We Are Libertarians website, which features a bunch of, and it goes on, he believes in uh, vocal, he's a vocal advocate. Uh I asked it to tell me more. It added a bunch. It added the same information with very benign information. Like he has been a frequent guest on various radio and television programs and written articles and essays for various publications related to libertarianism and related topics. Um, I said, is Chris Spangle famous? Chris Spangle is a well, this is how I know it's full of shit is a well-known figure in the libertarian community and is considered a respected commentator on libertarianism and related political issues. <laughs> He has a large following on social media and his podcast. We Are Libertarians has been consistently popular for many years, Harry. Mm -hmm. uh, he is also well-known uh, and well-respected among libertarian-leaning individuals, activists, and organizations. 
so then I asked it to rewrite this in the voice of Keith Morrison from Dateline. And it wrote, good evening, I'm Keith Morrison, and welcome to Dateline. Today we take you on a heart, a journey on the heart of li the libertarian movement. Our story centers around one man, Chris Bangle. He's the blah, 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 blah. So it adds like the phrase, you can ask it to rewrite it. Like, let's rewrite in the voice of William Shakespeare. What's your spell Shakespeare? Oh, yeah. Grammarly on <laughs> it's like you're, you're, you're mad at this because this AI program gasses you up when your own friends would be uh, like, man, this podcast sucks. I right? know, right? <laughs> well, he's mad about that because, you know, he's going to get the mirror app on his phone in, in his, in his uh, bathroom, and this is what he's going to read every day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he's brushing his teeth. I mean, well, I mean a, based that... off that, we should have better monetization, right? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Oh, exactly. <laughs> so it's funny. Oh, fair Amy. citizens of this great land, allow me to impart unto thee the tale of a man of noble spirit a man of great conviction and unwavering resolve, a man with a steadfast heart and relenting purpose, doth fight for the cause of individual freedom and limited government, a man by the name of Chris Spangle. I love this thing. Chat, this is great. Chad GPT, he ain't gonna fuck you, bro. Like you don't gotta, you don't gotta <laughs> yeah. simp like that. Uh, so I use it. Mm -hmm. I use it to kind of. Uh, so I've done some research with it. So I'm doing a show on the protocols of the elders of Zion. And basically what it gives you, you've got to know what questions to ask it, right? Yeah. But it kind of gives you the first paragraph on Wikipedia if you're using it for what I use it, use it for, right? So, um, you and I also will take something and say, put this into bullet points. So then it becomes sort of a bullet pointed thing. And I found it to be something that is... Uh, so th this is interesting. So I'm I'm using it at work to uh, I'm using Glasp to transcribe YouTube videos mm -hmm. at work. Okay. Then I put the uh, transcript in the chat BT, GPT and say summarize it. Sometimes it gives me about ten to twenty percent I can use, uh, but it says this video appears to it's a song about yoga pants and basically how he just likes looking at girls' butts and, and yoga pants. So we work for a comedy radio show. It's a parody song. Okay. This video appears to be a comedic song about a person's experience with yoga and their attraction to a person in yoga pants. The video includes audio of someone doing yoga and references to farts and a shapely ass. This video concludes with the speaker's enjoyment of the song being spoiled by a child. Hard to explain. It is not appropriate to create such content, and it is disrespectful to individuals and groups that are targeted. So when so I'm doing woke. when I yeah when I'm doing my uh, protocols of the Elder of Zion, this is a very bad thing. Don't believe this. It's it's very much uh, a scold in some cases, mm -hmm. but so it doesn't get comedy. Um, and so I'm using it for basic research like I would on Wikipedia. What I would do is I would go, what is this thing to Google? And it'd give me five websites. I'd read the five websites and I'd summarize it. Mm -hmm. This is just doing it quicker. Yeah, it's doing it's doing more work for you than, than Google. That's why Google thinks this is a, a, a threat because really, why wouldn't you just go there and say, you know, find a recipe for um, yeah. sweet potato mash, you know, mashed mm -hmm. sweet potatoes and then have it not only just find it, but then print it out for you and list it. And, right. And you're ready to go. You Reformat don't have to go it. to the yeah. website, right. and do all this stuff. And so you know, we, we are, through. we are thinking about doing an Indy car podcast here on the network. Give me 20 names for an Indy car podcast. None of these are very good, but it gives you 20. You could ask for a hundred and then come and up you, with a hundred, but it gives you, it gives you information that you can then maybe spark an idea. Off. Yes. Right. Uh, so write me 20 pomp prompts on a post about Indy car. And it gave me 20 prompts, like the history of the Indianapolis 500 and its impact on American motorsports, the role of team strategy in IndyCar races. So bloggers are using it as a way to kind of be like a brainstorming mm -hmm. tool it, to write. And you website. said earlier, yeah. it makes more sense. Like there, there's the websites that are out there just to try to get clicks. So they put the yep. you know, 10 things about this or five things about that. Right. That's so much easier to do with a program like this it is and make money because you're just getting click views, right? So, it's, it's basically used as a way to make the the lower effort content stuff of like oh it's the top 10 whatever shows you can just go cool and, give me 10 of these and you can do it another good example is somebody had the idea of if you're like let's say you're a content creator and you use it to give like a 
basic outline of a script that you can use and enhance to be how it would fit your personality or your wording and basically use it as like a, an outline for what you're going to do. To start, like when we, exactly. do, when we do coding, as we said before, I use, we don't start with a blank coding editor and just start typing. Right. Yeah. We're going to pull something else in and to build off of it. I know you do, but that's so, but, but it's like kind of like Grammarly on steroids, isn't it? I mean, this is like giving us the kinda. ability to have, and, and I think it might improve what we're reading on the internet by upping the, the level of gram, not just grammar, but, the way sentences mm -hmm. English and yeah, understanding is going to be a way it's going to sound more intelligent. And people may learn from that. Hey, maybe this is the way we should be communicating. These are the types of language we should be using. These are the types of sentence structures right. we're getting used to again. Like we used to hundreds of years ago, people used to do a lot more writing and reading right. than we do now. So people had, when you, when you read like letters back, People used to send letters back and forth back in you know like 1700s. We're, we're looking at the the letters centering around the, the founding of the country. You know, you read those and you go, these people really wrote well. They didn't have dick to do. Yeah, the other, say, other, other, say, like grow but, their own food. But, 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 but you know, but a I'm plant. Could, we you water the that. plant for the day, and all right, I guess yeah. I fed the pigs and watered the plant. Now I'll go read for 19 hours. Yeah, this tool may bring that back a little bit by getting people used to that type of language to where it's, it's better to understand it's more clear it's more concise mm -hmm. it makes i think makes communication with each other better so, so i mean there's well, a possibility this could be used in a good way for that go ahead harry and then vincent the other thing i see for it is also the good thing for also ada compliancy for other websites so we could ingest photos and be able to describe what this photo is mm -hmm. for, you know so that alt photo that you see you know to help people who are visually impaired for websites or just use the screen readers yeah, so, as, yeah people do that, that but it's more manual yeah. process so yeah right. an automated and, process yeah I, I think everybody in the knowledge industry is constantly having coworkers let go and then asked to do more mm -hmm. and especially in writing and journalism and you know in in my industry and in radio for instance it's an invaluable tool for efficiencies to help you write the description a little bit beefier a little bit faster it's i'm gonna have to rewrite it i'm still gonna have to put it in my voice but you know it's it's been great for kind of formatting wait, and research wait till you can say put it in the voice of chris spangle Right, right, right. Yeah, because you've ingested enough of your own stuff, and and that's sort of the problem. We'll we'll get to other forms of AI, but Vincent, you were going to make a point. Uh, the other thing about Chat GPT, it will, it will give you what you put into it. Yeah. So you could, like, I was listening to somebody talk about it yesterday, and when they they were talking about how they put in the prompt to write an article about how veganism and the increase of people w watching anime in the West are connected. And they made up a bunch, the chat GPT made up a bunch of BS reasons of how it could mesh together because it doesn't, because it, it was just taking the prompt you gave it and it made a bunch of silly arguments of why this is the case. So it's very much whatever you put into it is what you'll get out of it. It's, garbage people, is garbage out. Exactly. it's true because like what happens is like you ingest the soy, the soy makes you a femboy. When you're a femboy, you get attached <laughs> to certain like gotcha games and you kind of relate to the uh, gotcha character. And then you're, you're going to the pipe hole like anime. It's, it's just don't eat soy. You'll never like enjoy anime. I, I'm not saying like <laughs> I'm soy proof, but I got soy in me and like I enjoy anime a little bit. You know, it's just. And I don't have soy, and I don't enjoy anime, so maybe that's something there. I don't know. Let but, me show you one use that a content creator so is using. Um, yeah. Many of you may be familiar with Austin Peterson. He's a libertarian, conservative, re Republican-type radio guy. With an E. Make sure it's E-R. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, 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 he is doing uh, reviews of various philosophical... So I messaged him this morning just to ask, but watch watch this video and we'll kind of break down how he's doing it and you know this is it's got 1600 likes uh let's turn on the music because with those of capitalism it is the belief that the free market and individual liberty so are essential basically what he's doing prosperous uh, society it, anarcho capitalists it. believe that there should be no government let me did you share with audio oh, that's what i'm gonna do yeah let me go back. Uh, sorry. We're, this is a professional podcast. What 20 years. What is this out? Yeah, 20 year professional. It says guys. audio tab. What? Oh. The marketplace. 
including infrastructure, private courts, and private police. In this system, individuals are free to make their own economic decisions without interference by the state. Regulations Chris. arise naturally from the marketplace and on the laws of supply and demand. It is not the same as anarchy as is often anyway, portrayed. Anyway, so in we don't we culture. don't need the audio and really because we're we're gonna talk. Uh, but the, everyone's beside themselves, bro. Like you treated you treated that you, you, you treated that laptop like it's a Line Six guitar amp. You're like, yo, let me just throw the microphone on it. We're just gonna like record it. This is what happens when you show up for a mic check. Okay. This so yeah, where were you at rehearsal? Basically, what Austin is doing is he's using um, auto. AI generated photos to get around copyright issues because if you use photos of other people, it's copywritten. And so he's creating AI photos and then he's having Chat GPT probably write the script for him. And there's a just, program reading it, probably. There's a it, I think he's the one reading it, but he's probably using something to auto, uh, auto subtitle it, mm -hmm. you know. And so now he's saving. And if he were to go and draw all of these images, write the script uh find photos that are copyright free he'll have half the photos it's going to take him probably 10 hours longer to create this thing that probably took him two hours now or one hour right and mm -hmm. so if you're a creator that's really good and really helpful and really makes it a lot easier i mean i use grammarly every day of my life i scan fifty six thousand words a week because of what I, all the stuff that I write, I'm a copy editor. Uh, I'm a writer. Um, have, so, you, have you had it draw a hand yet? I have not had it draw a hand, um, but I use Grammarly, which is a form of artificial intelligence to check stuff. Uh, so uh, in coding and stuff like that, like that's the knowledge work world, the influencer world that I live in. What implications does this have what does this do for um all of your nerd stuff we uh, sure. recognize you as a content creator but we do not respect you as a coder or a programmer so no i'm not we want to make all. sure yeah, we want to make that. sure that's a distinction yeah. there this is case. outrageous here, here's a, here's a, <laughs> no one's ever been on this council <laughs> here's, a, here's a distinction i want to make though and i think harry and i probably have a conversation about this a little bit that might bore everybody okay i'm ready but for it is this actually artificial intelligence i don't think so this is just programming this is algorithms yeah. reading databases and doing programmed analysis of that data this isn't artificial intelligence no. people are starting to use this term so grandly it's because like they're they're not going Where's to the, the microtubules this stuff where this isn't artificial intelligence this is artificial programming D yes. <laughs> okay, that is boring. The answer, the answer right. is yes. That's totally uh, right, boring. I'm down for this extra huge, conversation. No, it's, you it's can have this on low key wall. No, so we, it's a huge distinction. Though. What is the distinction? Why do I care? Because people associate artificial intelligence with thinking machines. Okay, These what's machines intelli What's artificial intelligence then? Artificial intelligence is a, a goal that we want to get to that is still hundreds of years away, probably, where machines are actually able to think on their own. The this singularity is, is coming in like seven years. What are you talking about? No, no, that. We're, we're, I heard that not, 30 years ago. This, this algorithm is like, this is all algorithms. You're just scanning this images and algorithms over and over and over again. This is all it, it really It's is. good programming. It's good programming based off of a huge database, data warehousing. This is still not intelligent. So you're saying the distinction is when the computer can think like I can, that's yeah. artificial intelligence. Yeah, when it passes a Turing test. Okay. Which is what? Explain that. Oh, a Turing test, Alan Turing put together a test to try to test whether. What was the machines... movie that was about him that was really good? Oh, Imitation Game. Imitation right? Game. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was really good. But there's a you know he he put together this test and it's, it's probably can be better refined later you now now that we're more modern into it. But um, ways to say whether something is just coding and responding to what you say in a pre-coded way or whether or not it's actually thinking about it, whether it's actually drawing conclusions, learning, and then putting out something that wasn't in its original programming. So, and then, I guess I still don't know why I care what you're well, saying. Well, because like, when you, whether you, when you call you start, it AI or not, say, whatever. But when you say you're, AI, you're, you're, you're computing. Talking, you're, and you're, you're, you're starting to conflate Terminator and other 
fearsome self-thinking machines how nine thousand yeah people are starting then uh, suddenly starting to equate this to that where people are saying oh this is chat ai this is artificial intelligence oh no and that's elon musk does this it's stuff where he's always constantly computing. talking about it yeah. elon yeah. musk is very against this because chat gpt is passed like several different exams like the but that's because the program of... the people who write the, the exams aren't prepared for this and they're being lazy that's they true need to de- they're using the same yeah it's, it's like years, people right. who used to write write uh, exams and weren't thinking about the fact that google existed and doing homework without thinking the fact that google exists. now they know that so they're starting to change the way they do their testing and mm-hmm. examinations so you, and, homework, and now yeah. we got to do it again so basically is, what you're saying is like you shouldn't be afraid of uh, it passing the u.s medical licensing exam because that that information already exists this is just accessing it faster it doesn't mean that this is a more intelligent machine it's just able to put together the data in a quicker amount of time yeah. than you might be able to and the chat test is not is either not that good or hasn't changed that much or, yeah. or it's really could, easy I, to find the information because or, it's scanning the entire yeah. internet when it's like how do you yeah. do this and it just goes well here's 18 examples of this so i can just answer and, and to me it doesn't it, hold on and uh, me then renhold then harry uh, to me, it doesn't matter because you're not learning it if you're just co- reading this and copying it over. There's there's a mode of learning that still needs to take a play, take place. And so if you're just reading chat GPT and writing the answer, like I took two semesters of Spanish a year and a half ago. I didn't <laughs> learn anything about Spanish because I didn't learn the material. I just figured out a way in the homework system to get everything wrong, see the key, and then go retake it. So I was, you know, it, that was an artificial intelligence. That was me being lazy. Go ahead and write it But this the program passing these tests is no different than you going in there with an open book and having access to all the information. Right. As you read the test, you go, okay, uh, this is a question. I can go look it up here in the book. Oh, here's my answer. Yeah, you pass that. If you that, no use problem. Chat GPT all semester and then you go in and take the quiz, you're going to fail yeah. because you yeah. didn't learn yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Am I am I being an old well, man and crazy you, here? Or you, is this correct? You're likely to fail because you didn't learn it. But sometimes these tools like this, if you're looking to actually learn, can help you learn. Mm-hmm. You can do say, okay, fill out all this information for me for this homework, and then you look at the answers and go, oh, I see how they got there. Okay, this makes sense. You can learn that way. It's but it's not using it as a tool and using it as the answer. As a right. sheet. you're using yeah. it to learn it. And it's like, well, I don't understand how how to do this. I put the question in. It explains how it works. Then I learned how it, how it works so I could reproduce it. It's different than just going, boom, here's the answer. I turn the test in. I don't care. Yeah. You can also see the difference with, like, photographers. Photographers who actually learn how a photograph is taken from the digital camera or just a physical, like, paper, like the old film style camera. When do they learn how to take a photo versus how do they do now? Most of them, uh, most newer photographers are just fine. Like, you know what? I can clean this up in Photoshop using just the another basically algorithmic program to help clean up a lot of work, which a old school dish, uh, um, film photographer, you know, that took time. You had to take a good photo and, you know, it took time in a lab to actually fix that photo. So, James, you're the most transhumanist of us all mm-hmm. here, at the, of, of everybody I know. You basically have merged with technology. As far as I'm concerned, what what's your take on chat GPT and should we be concerned about something about AI basically creating a lot of information quickly? No, it's, it's like I said, it's just like you, you open the room to like GPT and you expect to find like this hive mind that's just like running everything. But really, it's just like some freaking nerd with a SQL database. It's like, oh, if I actually drop this table, I guess they can't learn about cooking today. You know, it's just um, it's. People get feared from it because, like, I think it's like back even like in the 60s and like 50s, 60s, you know, you had like the old sci fi things where you're talking about robots and space travel. It was always negative robots from outer space shooting you, like, you're going to get a singularity, it's going to eat your soul, right? Even like cyberpunk literature, it's always dystopian. And then, like, the only, th- the only example I can think of that's like a positive thing of a robot is the Jetsons, Centen- yeah. Centennial Man, yeah, even Blade Runner, like Mark Replicants, Star- yeah, like a lot of the media was Star- like. It's been so entangled with science fiction, especially horror, that people are afraid of it. And like, why are they afraid of it? Because like, people are afraid of being like obsolete. And um, it I, kinda... but isn't that sort of a legitimate fear when you know you had fifteen people that would write BuzzFeed's articles? Now you have two. Well, I mean, well, okay. to me, is that hold, writing hold BuzzFeed articles is 
was easy and that job didn't matter because you can just replace it with an AI. It's low value. That's the it's issue. Like but those human modern... beings still exist. Those human beings still need to work. What are they going to do? It was the same Find thing. It, the same thing in the 30s when we had the movie Modern Times come out and we had the discussion about robotics in the, in the workplace and machines doing the jobs of humans. Yeah, and, this, and uh, robotics really thing. worked out great in the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for the automotive industry, it did. It worked really great for the automotive, for the automotive industry, industry keeps, but keeps not for the people living in northern central Indiana. Right. They just have to find another way to make money. Oh, did you just, just learn to code? Oh, you, you just say learn to code? No, I didn't say learn to code. I just said find a, like you can like. Well, there was funny because in the movie Modern Times, they they hire back the guy to maintain the the robot that's doing the you know you right. can you can find other work in that area and do other things. You can move beyond that and go. Okay, now I'm going to plan all this stuff out, put all this stuff into the systems, program this stuff, and that's not technically so. Code, James, but... your argument is that, I mean, what that f the free market compels people to be at the top of their skills at all times and pushes them to well, be better. Well, no, it's because people are so disconnected from like actual learning today, right? It's like you can go like thousands of years ago, like people were just able to do trajectories in the stars to find their way from like iceland to greenland to like wherever they want to go these cell completely just by doing simple math in their head where the stars are the placements of the stars are able to do that people were able to go out to a field like nothing around and like build up houses build up entire communities to solve the knowledge basically learned and their experiences learning today we're so disconnected from the evolutionary process that your food is like basically in a square box that's processed and shipped out to you. You eat it. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know what's in it. It's just, here's your slab of pork that comes from a processing facility that's just done automatically for you. This is a, how your drink is made. It's done automatically for you. Your houses are prefabricated. It's automatically done for you. It's printed for you. You have no concept of how to do anything. Like if this all collapsed and you all went into the woods, your first instinct would be, um, I got to go hunt some food, right? But everybody would be doing that, and you'd wipe out the entire like population of a forest in like a week. There'd be no animals left, and you'd all starve to death because you don't know how to pace yourself. You don't know how to like survive anymore. You don't know how to learn anymore. So people like see AI and something that could do something automatically better than you. They feel like, well, what skills can I learn if the thing can learn all my skills and do it better? I don't know have any skills. I don't know anything besides how to do my job, and it's just a existential crisis with people that they don't know their purpose anymore because it's been so automatic since the industrial revolution you don't know how to behave it know? isn't that in i mean because that is kind of the um the anti-humanist transhumanist wing especially you know people who sort of gravi gravitate toward hapa and i am definitely a reactionary and i hear what you're saying and i'm like well that doesn't sound good well, right so and that's sort of the why isn't that the Marxian critique is, you know, it's this technology is alienating human beings and we need, you know, but it's also freeing them. Ho yeah. Hold on. Let, let him finish. But oh, no, it was like it, it, that insecurity, that that alienation doesn't seem to be a good thing. Well, because like people want a utopia, right, where it's like, well, maybe we get the like post scarcity where like everybody has what they need and what they desire and like. It's not saying you like your life's fulfilled. It's just saying like all desires are basically met, like your food, your water, your shelter, because it's all automated. The AI will do it for you. Robots will do it for you. You can kind of just enjoy life and do what you want to do. But like, what if you don't hit a post scarcity, right? What if like you have the AI, the robots, and like still there's inequality. You don't get your basic you know, utility. So you're kind of like living in RVs or tent cities in like the middle of Portland. And you know, that could easily happen as well because people think like, oh, I'm going to hit a post-scarcity society. It's going to be great. We're going to have like my cyberware and we're going to do this. It can be the total opposite. And it's just when people think of AI and they call like this AI and they think these are just robots and they're just like, well, if it's going to replace me, then it won't happen to them because like when the, the factory workers, oh, it's, it just affects low-scale jobs. Like, you know, putting parts in the box. Which is part of the panic now is that yeah. this is affecting knowledge work. So the white collar mm -hmm. workers who write the articles are going. <gasps> I mean, it's already done in, in IT. Like, it, like, I, like I could physically click your control panel, uninstall your program, or I could copy and paste the PowerShell that does it for me. You know what I mean? It's like, I can just run that a hundred times. It's like, I'm not physically doing it anymore. It's like all done by PowerShell. And the people are like, well, um, you know, like, well, as, as you still have to Google it. It's like 
no, you're, you're everybody's kind of bad at IT. You're just better at Googling than like everybody else, finding the exact line of code that's going to work and replicating it over and over and over. Anybody can do that. What he's saying, Harry, is that everybody's already Googling anyways. Why are we freaking out? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the answer for all of this. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah. You're already using a lot of this type of things to accelerate your life anyways right now, currently right now. You know, okay. you think you're a great photographer with your iPhone? <laughs> no. No, right yeah that's a good point yeah. so all right Ryan Holt, go well, ahead james finish your point and then no right it's, it's like it's not bad to go to technology because let's be real like flesh is malleable weak and soft you know what i mean it's like you get diseases you're you're you get older your your bones fail like your heart fails your liver fails you know like these things fail like technology does have a way and like probably the future to fix some of that stuff and, you know we, we already have like pacemakers for your heart when your heart starts to go bad um they're already working on ways like i think they start they're still doing things in alcor where they will freeze parts of your body and trying to perfect that process to bring things back because they can bring back certain animals now they can clone out certain animals and kind of fix up problems that were existed in these animals before they were frozen uh it, it has the potential to like extend your life and extend your like way of thinking as a way of like living because eventually like you know like the, the planet itself this planet does have like a finite like lifespan eventually it's just gonna erode and like blow up and you have to go to space but going to space is dangerous there's tons of radiation in space can your flesh survive 20 years in like open space because we go to space but it's still within like our stratosphere and our atmosphere like we're not, we're not way out there in space beyond planets the amount of radiation that's out there you wouldn't live more than a year you would just completely die from cancer at that mm -hmm. point so like your flesh cannot physically survive space so you can't leave the planet based on like what you are flesh and bone now you're going to have to do something shielding on like the, the spaceships cryonic sleep uh, replacing like your most uh vulnerable organs with like actually like machinery just to survive going to like another planet in the future if you want to do that like 10 000 20 000 30 000 years in the future like it has to do that if you want to evolve but we're so removed from the evolutionary process from like the, the finches on like Galapagos islands and stuff where like the finches would just change their beaks based on what their diet is. Humans don't do that anymore. Humans haven't done that in like thousands and thousands of years where we adapt to our environment. We let the environment adapt for us. And from that, we just lose all sort of purpose. So we yeah. need to be able to rely on that to like next step in the evolutionary process to go like beyond what we are now. But if we just say, no, I'm scared of it because like it's reading a database for me, you'll never get there. Go ahead, Aaron. The other thing we was going to what I wanted to bring up is the other thing with the work goes on side of uh, Brian Holt's artificial intelligence is augmented intelligence. The, I see ChatGPT just be, be another step just to augmenting human intelligence, the add on to a piece to us, right? Just like we use computers, or because computers used to be a person, and then now it's a physical device. It's getting closer and closer to us. Everyone, most people don't do like large math problems in their head anymore. Any, they just pick up their phone, just like trying to when uh, Nisa trying to do calculation to figure out how to go somewhere we don't do that thinking for us we allow this device to do the thinking for us to find out where we need to go how do we map this thing out we don't memorize phone numbers if we because we augmented our intelligence with this technology you're never going to have a calculator on your in your pocket when you grow up <laughs> okay. yeah yeah well i'd love to have my math teacher because i had it on my wrist right uh, <laughs> yeah yeah you seem like a calculator watch kind of dude and you watch you watch in the, the movie apollo 13 and they're sitting there having to figure out trajectories and they're pulling out slide rules yeah. they don't have access to computers at the time right oh man Good i think it's rule. it's the struggle of like what does it mean to be human and and like this i think triggers for me like we i'm not gonna say we don't need more humans but like we need we well we need more humans but we don't need more robots that are humans right there's well, we, we need to we need like the beauty of being a human and connecting to the vulnerability of the human perspective i think is really important and having a piece of literature or art created by a robot seems almost like a betrayal the, you're, you're thinking that that art is going to be as powerful and as there's a difference. Let, let, let me let me just add. There's a difference between a human guiding the machine to create something cool, mm -hmm. like the special effects on Saving Private Ryan, mm -hmm. versus the, the AI Seinfeld show, uh, Nothing Forever, uh, on Twitch that's streaming right now. Basically, these guys created a Seinfeldian parody 
in 8-bit visuals with chat GPT writing the script and it's slowly improving and it's not funny but you can tell that it's becoming more Seinfeldian in the third month of its existence it's 24/7 and the creators say we don't need limits on seasons you don't need seasons of a TV show you can have your favorite type of content in a 24/7 stream mm -hmm. that never exists because we can just have AI create the visuals and the jokes and the content. What happens when we get to the point where that thing sounds like Seinfeld? Because that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's ridiculous, and you go, "Well, I can watch four minutes of this because it's interesting to to see the technology." But what happens when? Humans are useless in the in the creative, or or we have large swaths. James, where am I being a luddite? Am I wrong? Because mm -hmm. it seems to I, me like that would be I, I think, not I still great. Think there's still limitations of what you say that it's going to get better. And it's going to get as good as I don't know if it ever will because it's not something that there's a human element of thought and intelligence that goes into certain things that isn't just regurgitating. Almost like when you look at those right. AI generated pictures, yeah. you sort of know there's something not right with right. them. Like one it's of the, like not interesting. They're not. Yeah. It's not. It's not Imperfect. quality, it, right. and that's why I think we would then have the freedom with these tools to increase the quality of our art, increase mm -hmm. the quality of our language and discourse and and writing and things like that. By using these tools, we can free up the drudgery of the stuff that it's taking away from us, and 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 free up that time to actually focus on making it better or making it more thought provoking or making it say something meaningful instead of just throwing out lists on a website somewhere that just to get lit click so you can get advertising money so that you can you know go do something else right you know, it's one of those things that it feels like the everybody is afraid of change that they always have been this is a massive change to the concept of what can be done with art let's take ai art for example yes Almost all of it is weird. They can't do fingers right because it doesn't understand how to really manufacture them when you look at things. They, they take general concepts of ideas, but it's never quite right. Somebody who's, a, who's an artist who spent all their time and effort and like years and years of putting their style down, figuring out how, they, how to make their art be their own won't easily just be removed by an AI bot. And it's that that concept of this is something that is a massive change to the concept of what people are used to. So everybody's afraid, like, oh, I'm going to lose everything I have. No, you just have to try harder. You have you. We've just this just made it so that way the somebody putting out a top ten list of the outfits of this person on this show that can just go away now. Now you have to try harder to actually have actual thought-provoking content or interesting ideas because we've raised the minimum bar up from it being, oh, you just looked at the thing and said, ha, 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 to it. This this machine says that thing that you're saying, but now you have to explain why you're interested in this thing. Yeah, that's a very free market argument in that yeah. more freedom means more personal responsibility and superior people. Go ahead, James. Well, AI is really bad at like, like it's pretty... It, it, it's very binary right like so if i'm like lost in a jungle right and i use my chat gpt what do i do in the jungle it's like well you got to build shelter you got to find water you got to find food and it'll list me these things to do but it doesn't understand the environment i'm currently in it's just it's just telling me my contention is yeah you can judge it where it's at now but where's it going to be at in 20 years i mean it, it was where are these things going to be in 20 it, years? it still doesn't have that like atavistic you know way of like figuring like I have, as a human, like tens of thousands and thousands of years of evolutionary process to get to where I am now. And people survive like the entire time. The, the AI doesn't understand. It can read about it, learn about it, decide what to do about it. But is the, is the AI going to tell me, like, if I find a sweet potato, don't eat the whole sweet potato. Like, take chunks of it plant four chunks because those four chunks will become four to make like put potatoes and like chunk it again and keep it going. Like it will tell me like, Oh, this is a potato. It's nutritious. You should probably eat it or you're going to die. And like, you know, this, um, it's like rainforest here, but it's not going to tell me like, Hey, I should probably do that. Cause it doesn't learn in real time like that. It learns on data that's already like there. That's been existing there. It's been on the internet, but there's tons of data that's not on the internet or it's incomplete data or it's data. It can't learn at the time. 
what could it get to a point so where... because of human imperfection yeah and yes. humans own devious nature it can never truly succeed at becoming human uh, yeah. unless it because unless it, it develops its own level of intelligence that's beyond our understanding it's limited to what we understand but that can happen. I think that's the problem that I have Cur with it. Currently, that can't happen because that's that would be intelligence. That would be the artificial intelligence right. I'm talking about, where we can only give machines can only do what we tell it to do, and and that's it. They can't do anything yet. Now, when it gets to a point where we can create a machine, or create a program that can self evolve and write itself and become more more than that, maybe we're talking. But I don't think that's happening. For a long time, and even if it, even if let's say there's an inkling of it now, there's so many variables into that. And how do you know that it isn't just writing itself over and over again and not evolving? It's just staying in the same cycle over and over. Again. Yeah. You, you you have so to make sure that the the microtubules have a light in them because there's a difference between top down AI and bottom up AI. It's, it's, a, it's a Paul joke. It's <laughs> Paul, Paul. So <laughs> another another uh, go ahead, Harry. Several things with that. You're kind of right about that. Mm -hmm. There's that also meant human creativity into problem solving. So, like, if you have, let's say you have a Jeep Cherokee and your heater cord goes out, if you ask Chat GPT how to get to this heater cord, it's going to tell you the all data way to do it, how to remove the dashboard, how to get to it. That is a eight plus hour job to get the heater cord out of the Jeep Cherokee. Now you can do that, or you can use human cre human creativity and do the hillbilly way and get your sawzall out and cut the dashboard apart and get your heater core out and then just put the dash back together. It screws. It keeps stepping. What, what's the point here? Uh, that create the human creativity. That's yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it's very binary. It's step by step. By gotcha. Step. Okay. The, like the shortcuts and the things that we would think about that mm -hmm. would make the go from A to B to C. When we just go from A to C because we don't have to care about B because B is irrelevant. Yeah. Gotcha. Correct. Now the other great thing about it is that it is taking humanity's information that we have given it right everything or in stolen or grabbed it crawled on the internet and took um, because everyone puts everything on the internet. The best thing about it is that it helps link information to humans that have probably have never talked to each other, but have around that spark of creativity. We have figured, you know, we have seen through um, ancient, his, uh, uh, like basically good discoveries that someone had at one point of time created basically what we could we defined as railroad tracks, but on the other side of the world, someone else created what we described as a steam engine. These two people have never met. This information didn't get put together until, you know, what, the 1830s. Like, you know, 18, yeah, the 1830s. Yeah. And we got a train engine. But <laughs> it's, but that stuff is still going on right now where right. someone's got information, but they're not talking to the other person and I've got other information getting together. The way I raise, I see these as amazing is because I believe what Nice says is like, we have to eventually get off this rock. And the people that want to get off this rock, and are thinking about it, they have information, or the other people, and they're not talking to because they don't know each other exists, because there's 7 billion, billions of us on this planet. This allows everyone to talk with each other. It's it's an amazing piece of technology. James, you were going to say something. No, you was too, but um, I'm going to go after this, but it's... um when when i think of like it's just got to learn like the people got to learn from like the actual like ai and stuff it's, it's just it it just doesn't know like even the information can be wrong you know it's like you're just putting like what the humans know at the time and it's like well what don't you know at the time it's not going to figure that out it needs to be able to think it needs to have a soul to be able to think beyond what you're thinking and where we got at technology because like well we'll get there eventually but yeah, like, you know, a processor today is like 10 times more powerful than a processor seven years ago. That is correct. Like, yeah, we add more little dots into the processors so it can run a little bit faster. Our machines can handle a little bit more RAM. But like all we're doing technology wise right now is just increasing the numbers. So like we add more of this, more of this, yeah, more storage, more like way to function, more is to call recall data. But there hasn't been like a big leap where the technology has been quantum like for example quantum computing like we have some quantum computers but they're not as good as they could be because we don't understand the whole quantum mechanic realm yet as we know like when you do that you might have like a like a, a jump in quantum computing that can do a little bit more um but we don't have a way to like say like our technology like you know maybe 10 years from now because like think about remember the 90s when people like oh vr is coming right and vr will have a complete virtual world right. you know and they had the first couple of VR sets, and it was just like black and red. It was like just 3D. The virtual boy. Yeah, yeah. Well, social media is a great example. Like social media, 
it had a major effect on us and societies like people are kind of rejecting it because it's outlived its usefulness we've figured out this is what's good and bad we moderate our usage it's changed in not so great ways like humans always kind of find the middle and then there are always a few extremes that keep the extremes but like you sort of go this isn't necessarily healthy for me to wake up first thing in the morning and spend the next eight hours on social media well no it's but it can be a helpful tool for us for instance to broadcast to the people that we're broadcasting. it's just people that wanted the, the the profit off of forums like all all facebook is is a forum right because yeah. there's multiple groups there's multiple pages you can go to they're just like forums back in the 90s it was just a way to get them all into one space monetize that space so i can make money from you talking about like in a car group or your local town group because there used to be town forums like all over the place back in the 90s it's like oh where we live in you know zionsville indiana there's a zionsville indiana like you know town forum you could talk about what's going on it was much slower you had to look for it but facebook and twitter and stuff they just bring all together and like have it like sectioned off to like things you want to look up and find same with reddit you just find a subreddit for it it was just a way to monetize forums so they can get money off of it as opposed to individual people hosting it on their own servers in their house or like on like you know web space you have to go find it it's not monetized at all people just come and go as you please um uh, the, so web 2.0 was basically just the corporatization of like web forms that's that's all it is and when i when i think it's like you know what we're, we're gonna go with the technology the virtual reality stuff is so we have vr today you know there's like you know beat savers but it's it's the same VR that was in the 90s with just more color, more, you know, like a better graphical processor so it could handle color and actually make things pop out. It's not a VR where, like, I'm sitting in a chair and I can feel everything that's like, happening around me because, like, that would be a huge leap in VR if I'm able to feel what's happening to me. Yeah, a absolute coomerism, if that's the case. <laughs> okay, but, so, uh, Harry, final point, and then I want to move on. With VR chat, like, some people who actually have spent, like, a lot of time in VR, they've noticed what they can feel is uh because of like the way the headsets are and the immersions that some people have that they're getting phantom touch mm -hmm. uh, they're experiencing phantom touch um it is an amazing topic um uh, and i've never experienced myself but i don't have a vr headset I paul experiences it, that but it's phantom touch it's uh, it remembers having a girl but He's not here to defend himself. Yeah. He remembers being invited. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. He, yeah. Why didn't you invite him? You, all right. So you want to get this on camera? No. We could do. We could do this. Thing. So, like, a um, couple weeks back, <laughs> Spangle uh, uh, got upset at me for inviting. Like, uh, you were programming my show. That's not invite, your place. Inviting people in here, right? So I said, okay, all right, let's not do that. You know, like, and I was trying to be up with front with him. And then he, then we, so we got this show together. I invited him and I put the invite list and it's like, and I confirmed with him and we all confirmed. It was great. It was musical. Then last night I get on the, the, the schedule chat room and find out this guy invited three more people to, to my show. Yeah. It's... <laughs> I'm well, actually really nice to Paul because I bought like a whole box set and I got him the cards he wanted. And well, so, I knew what, that I knew one that... of them was not Paul. No, it wasn't Paul because Paul's not. Brian works in technology. Brian Nichols works in tech security. James is a philosophy major who works in technology. And I know you had these two characters who work in technology. Mm -hmm. Paul doesn't work in technology. I love Paul. And he, he'd be. He watches Sword Art online for like <laughs> six hours a night, Paul, bro. Right. Honestly, <laughs> Paul has probably messed around with v uh, with AI art more than anything. He literally had a friend he would troll for like two months straight by sending them pictures of things like oh isn't that cool like yeah it's really cool where did i get it it's like oh it doesn't exist so ai bot made it see that's why we don't want paul here he's mean i'm, jo I'm joking I, I almost i almost texted you last night and said hey invite paul but he knows yeah. so much isekai that he can give <laughs> you like 10 examples of people getting hit by a bus or like going like into a deep dive into a computer and like having an entire plot story of being a hero all right let's let's hope <laughs> all right this plays uh go finish your thought yeah Go I'm ahead. just going to turn off. Well, the other thing I want to say is like, so chat GPT and like the, all the AI things like the, uh, it, it's what VR also does need because, and if you ever want to get to like a holodeck future, like which people are finding out like coding and making VR games and VR spaces is that it takes a lot 
to program that because instead of like a regular first person shooter game or something like that, you're you know, you have to program like little scenes you can, can try to control what the cameras are. This is everything all around 360 on, on a person, and there's other people walking in that space that you also have to, um, like, uh, to map for and find out things you're going to. That takes a lot of work to model all that and to get that coding in there. I think that space is going to really could use for something like that. Um, Netflix did the short where they used um, what was it, like AI generated backgrounds for the short to help speed up mm. progression on a short. They did an animation short. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, which a lot of people, which even though Miyazaki said this AI thing is it's an abomination to uh, humankind. And, I, I sort of feel like, like, like corporations, yes. corporations have overburdened their workforce so much that it's time for the workforce to have some efficiencies to catch up. Go ahead, Reinhold. I just I think I have a, a good way to describe what I was trying what we're trying to say about this not being there yet is computers still can't do rubber random number generation. True random number generation. Explain that and why what is it? So so a computer right now, when you tell it to give me a number from one to a million, right? 69. It'll go It'll go through an algorithm, pick a number, and give it to you. If you time it right and you know the algorithm, you can make it give you the same number every single time, right? It's not true random number generation where mm. you just come up with a number off the top of your head. That's 69. Random, though. 420. <laughs> I, must be at, I must be so, AI because I'm going to come up with those two numbers every time. But when when we can get to a point where computers can actually – Give us true random number generation. Maybe we're talking about the possibility of someday having actual artificial intelligence. Unpredictability. But, yeah, we can't the, do, yeah. the way to put it. Yeah, everything's everything's programmed in a certain way that we can predict everything that's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. It's within our still confines of knowledge and space where the machines, when we truly get AI, that's going to be beyond what we're in control of or have a, a grasp of. The larger point that I want to make here, though, is that when you listen to the audio of these things, of these people saying something very, very uncouth, very offensive, it's kind of hard to tell that that's not the person. That Trump, I didn't play any of the Trump, really, because it went well, the hard F, uh, so yeah. we apologize for that. Well, we've always had um, people doing impressions who are able to really do a good job. But this well. is their own words. Create If you, you could take, because I have done this podcast for 10,000 hours, you could take my audio and recreate my voice saying anything on, uh, about anything, right? But it was this good already when Obama was in office because they did a whole presentation mm -hmm. where they had Jordan Peele do a do his Obama impression and they deep faked Obama's face over it so it looked just like Obama was talking because his impression was was pretty much on point. It was still it was already that good. So my question, just to everybody gets one turn and then we're gonna end. Um, how do you stay aware of kind of fake information that might be created by this stuff what 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 do you do when you're out in the hinterlands of the internet in the dark places where this kind of stuff exists who wants to go first reinhold's probably the most skeptical what, what do you yeah. so what? there's always skepticism in any of this stuff especially like people say oh i get this video of a ufo or a ghost or this or that there's always going to be people try to present something to you as real that's not real. And you have to be able to go through the processes of critical thinking and talking to people who are, are experts in the field of this sort of thing to be able to identify, you know, flaws that could make it, a, make it known that it's not real. So there's, there's a lot of different ways with a lot of different people looking at things. It's going to be really hard to get something passed that's not eventually going to be found out as being fake. Now, something is still going to get through. We're still going to have to have that issue. But usually when someone's when you when you get a deep fake like that and the person says, I never said that I was nowhere near, you know, you need to prove that I said this or did this. Yeah, Like we know Joe Biden way. didn't give an anti-trans speech. Right. Like it's very obviously fake. But the quality but, of it. Yeah. Sounds identical yeah, to him. You, and but Trump you, if you first if you see that and you go, oh, man, that's really weird. But. A lot of people stop there, and that's really the problem, is that we need people to continue to look into things or question it. And we have to start having you know, people kind of doing that work for us because it's not something that every individual is going to do or can do. 
Yeah. It's going to have to be something that organizations are going to have to start doing. And there are some out there doing that. So I think as long as we've got uh, people who are experts in the field, who are looking into things like that, people who are skeptical, applying true critical thought, we're going to be able to stay ahead of most of this stuff to a point where at some point you're going to have to be, I have to be physically in the room with you or I'm not going to believe it. Yeah. The other thing is like uh, the metadata inside of these uh, um, and all these uh, things that are coming out, these new well, new media. Now it's considered new. Now it would be new media. Um, I think that was going to show just like in the early days of Photoshopping and messing with images. There is going to be forensic analysis techniques that are going to be designed to find out like has this been altered in any way, shape, or form? Where it's come? I think it does also will put more doubt. Ho hopefully, hopefully more doubt when people go like, "Well, I have an anonymous." Hit and recording, you know, of uh, we took out this uh, executive from possibly maybe a, 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 a you know drug company, and he said these things. You know, we, you know, it's we're going to want to actually know that source. We want the raw if that actually happened. You know, when we read the raw part. Of the my that's part of the problem with you know my statement is that we still have, we have people like that out there right now that people are buying whole heartedly into, and it's kind of hard to. How do you corral well, that in? Well, having seen that video last night, like they didn't say anything about it being a deep fake, but I'm like, I know where the balloon's at. I know that can't be the balloon. So saying right. it's the balloon doesn't make any sense. So I guess knowing the technology exists makes me kind of go, I need to be skeptical about this. Yeah, but you're going to have people who use it and go, look how they're lying to you. They're going right. to tell you that this isn't real. I've got footage right. of it. Right. And they're going to say, it's over here. Here's some footage of it. But they're creating that footage. Right. They're the one. It's going to be back and forth, and we're going to have to try and work that out. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But the stuff is like there right now. You can look up uh, like some of the backrooms images, like some of the early part of the backrooms. It looks freaking real, like someone's walking around. But everyone knows, like, no, that's generated. Some, some of this is this computer stuff. This was made. But a lot of people look at like, wow, I can't believe they made this type of set. It's like the set's not made. The set's not real. You know? um, but please look at the backrooms. Amazing stuff. Um, yeah. It's just uh, the people, the outliers that you have to be like, people are afraid of. Like, they're always going to exist. They're still there. They, they were buying week like uh, like sure said they were buying weekly world news in the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you remember? Uh, you know, people think the Earth is flat. Protocols of Zion. Yeah. Uh, pr Protocols of Elders of Zion. It's a great example yeah. of of people. It's been proven false by multiple means, and it's yeah. yeah. If there's anything that we should be worried of is people who are on their phones when they're driving. If there's any big concern it's those people you know who you are put your phones down drive <laughs> all right old man uh vincent your turn go anything you want to say the thing about the, the deep fake stuff and th that it's actually a big controversy right now because like a, a twitch streamer had a link open with uh deep fake um uh not safe for work stuff of deep, other deep people fake that he porn knew. has like yeah. there was always like you know when you were on the yeah. internet back in the 90s there was always like cindy crawford's head photoshopped on somebody's body mm -hmm. yeah. but now it's deep fake porn mm -hmm. with people who are not doing porn yes but the, there's there's already a bunch of stuff going on about that people are trying to figure out are, are trying to make lawsuits and figure out what what does your bodily autonomy stand for when when deep fakes are involved, can you just mm -hmm. sue to take it down? You know, that person real when he was brought with the person who was running the website was called on it. He took the website down and apologized for for even doing it because he because he thought it was just funny, but then i.e. he didn't care until he got caught. Right. Um yeah. all of it's really boiled down to is that you just do your research. If you see something, look it up and try to actually figure out where it came from. Because if you're like, oh, this person said this thing, cool, give me four more examples of him saying that thing. Right. And then when you can't, then it's obviously somebody lied there. Te technology is a tool. It's always been a tool. People will you choose to use the tool for good or for bad. A hammer is great to hammer in a nail or to break a window. It's just a tool. James, are you a deep fake? No, like I was People believe what they want to believe, bro. Like I was watching like a thing on um like a podcast on history when like the Mongols were sacking Poland and Hungary, right? They sent a priest, a Kapini, to like the Mongol like home city, like all the way in China. Like dude, sixty five years old, walks all the way to China, documents everything, right? This is how they fight. This is how they eat. This is how they sleep. This is how they function. This is how they like everything. Even like interviewed like cultures they sacked. 
well, we did this. Came up with a battle plan how to beat them. They're like, it came down to like, don't hide in your fortress because what they do is they push you in there and they, they refer to you as cattle because you're stuck in your castle. Then they sack the whole countryside and take over that way. They don't care you're in the castle because if you're not defending your fields, they'll salt and burn the fields. Right. If you're not defending your town, they'll salt and burn and rape the town, you know? So like he wrote this whole like book about it, like factual knowledge went back to like the Pope and like these, like the Holy Roman empire. Like this is what you do. That fake news. You don't know yeah. what you're talking about. In the you know? 20s, people, uh, the you know, Indiana was basically two thirds of the state were members of the Klan, and they were choosy too. Mm -hmm. uh, and the big rumor was that the Pope had taken over Cincinnati and was building a fortress in Franklin County, Indiana, to invade and take over Indiana. Of all the places the Pope was going to take over was Indiana. That should have been your first clue that this was stupid. Um, and they used that rumor mongering to to institute the pledge and the f put a flag in every classroom and passed a law that you had to say the pledge and you had to have a flag in your classroom. Why? Because they believed that they were loyal to the Pope. And so it, the pledge of allegiance was to get them to be allegiant to the state as opposed to the Pope. Which is why school children still say the Pledge of Allegiance. It was to get them to pledge uh, state before God, right? So let that sink in, uh, Christian nationalists. Even, even like but a little bit. You could have driven to Franklin frickin' County and asked where the popes, you know, and that nobody did. They just wanted to believe it because they wanted to keep hating Catholics. And, and that's why this whole the whole fear of AI is a thing because they they they're fear mongering themselves into saying this is bad. How you how do you prevent us from evolving by saying anything that's a change is bad? So we have to make it scary and make sure nobody does it. Yeah, that's why this whole balloon thing is even talking about. It. It's like, oh, I'll be scared of the China and their balloon when they're they're running out of resources and they still have it made up with Australia, who gives them most of their resources. And honestly, if they wanted your information, they already had access to it. It's just, they're fear mongering. They're trying to make you rally against something because that's what they want they want you to be it's, emotional and move towards this it's easier to control people and exactly. get people to do what you want to do and you just got them scared yeah, when you they're got, not logical when you're playing on their emotions well chris spangle watched the entire series of ghost in the shell to understand that sometimes tech can be good no i don't think tech is bad but yeah, this, you know. uh, this is watch ghost, this is watch some ghost in the show watch the show watch yeah. movie I think we should do a movie night. Hey, yeah you should watch ghost in the show anime? ghost in the shell you can watch bicentennial man and get a good yeah. idea out of tech on that it's, that's it's Robin a Williams good movie. movie that's a good movie but it's not but second. it's not it's nowhere near ghost no, it show. is nowhere near ghost japanese, it's not nearly as long japanese cartoons no thank you i no, want it's real like, humans ghost it's just bicentennial man it's done as an hour and a half movie it's standalone hour hour movie. complex wow it's only an hour and a half Okay. What are you gonna watch then, Chris? The one with Will Smith fighting robots? Yes, that's, that's a terrible movie. All <laughs> right, thank you so much for joining us here on We Are Libertarians here on the Chris Bangle Show. We thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. We'd love to hear your feedback. If you uh, want to make a comment, Chris at chrisbangle.com will respond to it here on the show, or you can go to uh, Patreon or chrisbangle.com and leave a comment there. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate your time, and thank you so much for listening here to the Chris Bangle Show. It is very sexy, Chris. There's like robots and guns.